Good morning, everybody. Great to see you today. People are still coming in, and that's always good. Uh, we're always delighted to see you coming into the house of the Lord, and we're particularly glad to see you on this last Sunday in June. Next Sunday will be July the 2nd, and so that's going to be a day that we'll uh, particularly give thanks to God for the privilege of being in the United States of America, and it's a birthday, uh, a Sunday before our nation's birthday, and I encourage you to wear something red, white, and blue next Sunday if you'd like to. You don't have to, but if you'd like to, and we'll uh, celebrate uh, our nation's birthday and give worship to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Uh, that's always uh, a blessing uh, to do that. Each of you who are here today, uh, we're pleased that you've come. We got a birthday girl today, and uh, that's Debbie Keller. Debbie's uh, celebrating a birthday today. Uh, it's one of those big ones, so during the time of fellowship later on, you may want to give her a, a happy birthday hug. Yeah, she's 40 today, so... Right, uh, Debbie? Yeah, okay, I thought so. Uh, but uh, anyway, be sure to let her know that. Uh, uh, it's good to have Faith back with us today. Faith, lift your hand where you are so people can see you. Faith's been traveling a pretty good bit. It's good to have Austin back. Austin back there at the back. Austin's been traveling too. Uh, Faith's been on the road. and Austin's been in the air and in the water and everywhere else. Uh, six different countries, Austin, that you uh, have been to since we saw you last. Is that right? Yeah. So uh, he's really been doing uh, some traveling. Kathleen is uh, back with us today. Kathleen, yep, uh, there's Ka Kathleen with us. William is back with us today. William, there, there you are. Uh, always good to have our visiting friends with us who, who are here. Mary Esther is uh, one of us now, so uh, yeah, not a, not, a, not a visiting guest with us uh, any, anymore, but uh, that's good. Uh, this Sunday is a special Sunday. Right after church, you'll have time to visit together just for a moment or two. Uh, Fadi Algahal is going to be uh, with us on the screen uh, in, in person live, uh, but uh, not in person here, in person on the screen. Uh, it will be a, a live presentation. He'll kind of give us uh, where we stand uh, with Brentwood right now and the ministry partnership that we'll be having with them and uh, kind of bring us up to date uh, about that. And then we'll be open for questions that you might have. The way Jonathan will have it set up is that we'll come right here kind of to the front with a microphone there and Fadi will be able to uh, see you and hear you and we'll be able to see him and hear him and questions that you might have that he doesn't answer in that uh, presentation. Uh, feel free to ask those uh, questions because he's ready to answer them uh, today. This coming Wednesday is our prayer service. Uh, our family is going to be taking some vacation time and heading south uh, to Alabama where all of Melody's family, everybody in her family, she has four children and their spouses and their children. And Melody is a grandmother, so that makes us grand, great-grands. And so we're going to uh, gather there for a couple of days. They're there for a longer period of time than that, but we're going to be there Tuesday and Wednesday and come back Thursday, God willing. So Jonathan will be doing prayer service this coming Wednesday at 11, and that's going to be a special time. It'll be the prayer service prior to July the 4th, and so Jonathan has some things in mind about praying for our nation, and uh, Jonathan, thanks for uh, stepping in there to do that. But again, we're glad to welcome you today. It's good to see you here in church and uh, faith particularly to have you back with us. I know that's just short term, but we're glad you're back today and uh, it is good uh, to see uh, e each of you here uh, for worship. And uh, we'll enter into worship, Jonathan and Lindsay and Steffi. Steffi is back with us today. We missed her last Sunday and so she's uh, back here today and so join in the worship. If you know the song, sing it with gusto. If you don't know it, 
think about the words and pronounce those words and say them off the screen. At this particular point, we've got both screens working, so yay for that, and we hope that will continue on throughout our uh, worship time so that you can see from both sides uh, better, and we hope that will continue on during our town hall meeting after church today. Let's worship together. Jonathan, Lindsay. All right. Well, Brother Mike said it's so good to see each and every one of you here today, whether it's your first time here with us or you're back from traveling somewhere or you've been here each and every week for a long time. We're just so glad to have each and every one of you here with us, uh, not only here in the room, but also online. We're uh, thrilled to have people joining us online as well for worship. So uh, wherever you are, whether you're here with us or you're joining us online, I'd love if you'd uh, stand and sing with us as we sing some songs together. We're going to start with a song called What I See. Do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? I see lightning, I hear thunder. Something stirring six feet under. Dead things coming back to life again. I believe there's about to be another resurrection. I see signs and I see wonders. I see bursts of living color. Dead things coming back to life again. I believe there's about to be Leaning on the everlasting arms. Sing it. What a fellowship. 
Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Jonathan and Lindsay and Steffi, for leading us this morning. You may not have ever heard that first song before, but what great words that uh, make us think in terms of revival since we're continuing in that theme from Nehemiah in the messages here in just a, in the message in just a few moments. And uh, so we do ask God to stir the w sleeping, to stir the dead, to do the thing that only God can do, and that is to raise those who are dead from their sleep, whether that means kind of spiritual sleepiness or whether that means dead in Christ who will rise again. It's a great triumphant song. And then leaning on Jesus, leaning on his everlasting arms. Amen for that. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Would you bow with me, please, as we pray together? Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. We enter into the Holy of Holies right now. You know, the tabernacle was divided into the Holy Place and then the Holy of Holies. That place only the high priest could enter once a year, make atonement, other times for confessing the sins of the people and entering into that Holy of Holies place. When we pray together now, we enter into the Holy of Holies. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says the veil between the Holy Place and the Holy of Holies was rent and opened up. Now you and I can enter into that Holy of Holies through our personal prayer and through our corporate prayer. Corporate prayers when we pray together as a congregation. This is an important day for us to hear from Fadi about our next steps in our partnership with Brentwood Baptist. But it's also an important day just because we have prayer and we have giving to God, back to Him out of His blessings to us. We have the opportunity to open God's Word and hear from it about the results of revival. And so today, surely, we want to pray that God would pour out His Spirit on us in a new, fresh way. Today, there may be you, maybe you've come to God's house and you have a, a particular burden or anxiety or care. Maybe it has to do with your own well-being or your own health or the health of a loved one. Or perhaps today there's just a, a care that you have for our church in the community and in this city and in our world that's so lost. We know we hear about wars and rumors of wars. Jesus said that those would be some of the beginning signs before he comes back again. And maybe you're troubled about this war-torn world or this society in which we live that does not know the joy of peace. Today I'd like to pray with you if there's a particular burden that you have on your heart today. I won't ask you to stand, but just quietly lift your hand where you are today and let me look around and join you in prayer. Yes, on both sides of the aisle, so to speak. I see you. Yes, thank you. You may put them down. So, Father, now people and pastor join together in prayer. I pray, Lord, that these who've lifted their hands will, even in this moment, feel the peace that only Jesus can give. You know what it is that they are concerned about. You know, whether it's personal or whether it's family or whether it's friends or whether it's our situations that our world finds itself in, whether they are particularly praying for Dalewood Baptist in these days, what, whatever it might be, Father, I thank you that you are right now knowing and hearing and doing something about their prayer request. I join them in prayer. And then all of us pray together today, Lord, as a congregation. We confess our sins. We're sinful people. We thank you for the forgiveness that we find in Jesus Christ, who on the cross paid it all. All to him we owe. Thank you for that salvation that is so perfect in every way. 
Father, today we thank you that not only are we cleansed and healed through the blood of Christ, but we are forgiven in such a way that we can begin life anew. We praise you for that. Father, we ask you to continue to hear us as we worship through song, continue to be aware of our gifts that we give back to you, the tithe that belongs to you already, and that we return to you and offerings that are above that, that we freely give today. Thank you for the privilege we have to give. Thank you that we can invest in the kingdom, the eternal kingdom. We know that all the other things that we invest our money in, those are temporary, but when we invest in the kingdom of God, that's a permanent investment. And we thank you for that privilege today. Father, we ask you to continue to be with us as we worship together today, as we give and as we listen and as we respond. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say, amen, amen. Thank you, Brother Mike. Uh, let's stand and continue to sing together. Let's just sing, Lord, I need you.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for the day. Lord, we thank you for the privilege that we have, Lord, to be in this place. Lord, to fellowship with one another. Lord, to sing praises to you. And Lord, I just pray that you just be with Brother Mike as he brings the message that you've laid on his heart. Help us, Father, to apply what we hear to our life. So, Father, we just come to that time of the service, Father, that we just give back to you, Father, a small portion of what you have blessed us with. So, Father, bless the gift and the giver, for it's in the precious name of Jesus I ask it all. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat as we take our offering, but I'd love it if you would sing with me. This is a song we've done uh, last week and then a couple weeks before that. Uh, just kind of a, almost a theme song for this series that we're singing called God of Revival. So I'd love it if you'd sing with me.
people said, Amen. Oh God of revival, pour it out. Pour it out. Revival is the theme of Nehemiah 8, 9, and 10. And we're looking at those chapters right now here at Dalewood Baptist and thinking about revival. One of the preachers that I've been blessed by for so many years who's in heaven now, Dr. E.V. Hill. He was the pastor of a mainly African-American congregation out in the L.A. area, the Watts area of Los Angeles, a powerful, great church. And he preached on a number of occasions at pastors' conferences and Southern Baptist conventions that I attended. I heard him preach once, and he, uh, he was describing an event that he was preaching for. And just before he stood up to preach, the pastor told him that in the audience that day, would be the leader of the Black Panther Party in that particular city, a female. And, of course, at that time, the Black Panthers were an organization of primarily African-American persons who were kind of seeking the overthrow of the nation or the city or wherever that might be. And so that night, uh, E.V. Hill spotted her out. He could just tell that there she was out in the congregation, and he preached to her. And when he got through preaching... He gave the invitation and she did not come forward. But after the service, she spoke to him and said, Preacher, I know tonight you were hoping I would accept Jesus as my Savior. He said, Yes, I was. She said, Well, I didn't, but I wonder about this. If I had accepted your Jesus, what would I have? And E.B. Hill then began to tell her what she would have if she had Jesus, the hope the forgiveness, the cleansing, the peace, the joy. And in fact, E.V. Hill said after that, he preached a whole series of sermons on what would you have if you had Jesus. And he preached one sermon on faith and joy and peace and hope and forgiveness and cleansing and so forth. Now she didn't accept Christ that night or he didn't know whether she did later or not, but I thought a lot about that question. If I had accepted your Jesus... What would I have? And I've thought about it for a whole congregation. If we had revival, what would we have? When revival comes, what will it look like? Well, Nehemiah tells us. And beginning in chapter 8, the last verse, and picking on up on, in chapter 9, we see what would happen when revival comes. Nehemiah 8 verse 18, and then following right on into chapter 9. Would you stand with me as we honor God's good word and let's see what happens when revival comes. And Nehemiah is recording in his journal. You know, they had built a wall and now they were experiencing a great outpouring of the Spirit of God, convicting of sin and, and committing to the Word of God. And it was just an exciting time of revival at the water gate, you remember, one of the 12 gates around the wall of Jerusalem. And it says, And day by day, from the first day unto the last day, he, that is Ezra the scribe, Ezra and Nehemiah were the two who were uh, leaders in this rebuilding of, of Jerusalem. He, Ezra, read from the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days. And so on the eighth day, it was a solemn assembly according unto the manner, according to the way God had prescribed. Now, Chapter 9, verse 1. Now in the twenty and fourth day of the tenth of the children of Israel were assembled with fasting. Notice that word. And with sackcloth, that word, and earth upon them, dust on their heads. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers 
that is, people who were not God worshipers, and they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. And they stood in their place and they read in the book of the law of the Lord their God from uh, one fourth of the day and another fourth of the day they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. Uh, Twelve hours uh, all together and six hours they read the word of God and six hours they confessed. And they then stood up upon the stairs the Levites and it names these Levites beginning with Jeshua and then uh, the other Levites. The rest of the verse says, And they cried with a loud voice unto the Lord their God. Then the Levites, and it names them once again, and it says, they, uh, The Levites said to the people, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever, and he, he be blessed and bless the glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and all praise. And then a prayer begins. Thou, even thou art Lord alone, God. You have made the heavens. You have made the heaven of heavens and all the hosts, all their angelic hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, everything in the earth, the sea and everything is therein. And you preserve them, you preserve them all. What a great God we serve. And the host of heaven worships you. And then this prayer begins. I'm not going to read that whole prayer. It's the longest prayer in the Bible. But it goes all the way through to toward the end of uh, Nehemiah chapter 9. And I pick up at the very last part of that prayer in verse 32. And as Ezra apparently is the one wording this prayer and Nehemiah joining in with him and saying amen, so to speak, they conclude the prayer with verse 32. Now therefore our God, the great the mighty, the terrible God, who keep covenant and mercy. Let not all of the trouble seem little before thee that had such a crisis, national crisis, and that thou that has come upon us, the trouble that has come upon us, and on our kings, our rulers, our princes, our priests, the church people as well, the church leaders, and our prophets, and on our fathers in the families itself and the leaders of the families and on all of our people since the time of the kings of Assyria unto this day, since the time they had been taken into captivity, even now the trouble that had come nationally. Howbeit thou art also just in all that thou brought upon us. Lord, you're, you're justified in this. We deserved it. For you have done right, but we have done wickedly. Neither have our kings, our princes, our priests, our fathers kept your law, nor hearkened unto the commandments and the testimonies wherewith you did testify against them. For they have not served thee in, thy king, in their kingdom. In other words, the leaders have not done right. And in great goodness you gave them, and you taught, and you have given them, and in the large and the fat land which you have given, which you have given before them, they turned from their, they have turned from their wicked works. Behold, now we, your servants, this day, for the land that you gave us and gave to our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof. Behold, we, your servants, are in it, and it yields much increase unto the kings that you have given them over because of our sins. In other words, we've, we've been taken over by the enemies because of our sins. Also, we have, they have had dominion over our bodies and over our cattle and at their pleasure. And we are in great distress. And because of all of this trouble, we make a sure covenant Lord, we're making a covenant, an agreement with you. And we write it. And our princes, our Levites, our priests, uh, they seal into it and unto it. In other words, Lord, now we've made this covenant with you. And here it is, Lord God, we're going to follow it. Father, we thank you for what happens when revival comes. Thank you for what happened in Israel that they were never the same after these days. God, 
send a revival. We've, we've said it in our songs today. We say it to you now in prayer. Send a revival. Oh, Lord God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You, you may be seated. So what would we have if we had revival? What would it be like? Well, there would be three things, I think, that are seen here in this text. If we had revival, it would have. First of all, there would be brokenness. There will be brokenness. This is repentance toward God. The Bible says in that concluding verse in chapter 8 that the people had been broken before God. They had wept. And then moving on into chapter 9, in that solemn assembly, the Bible indicates that the people were in prayer. They were, they were praying. And there were really five, five words. There was fasting. There was sackcloth and dust. There was separation. There was confession. And there was worship. And you know, always when there's revival, there's going to be brokenness that's going to come like it came right then. Uh, think, think about some of those words. The Bible says there was fasting. Fasting to me is an indication of uh, appetites being broken. When you fast, you forget about the food or you bypass the food. Maybe you don't completely forget about it, but you focus on something else other than food. Any of you who've ever fasted, I can testify to the same thing. Whenever we fast, we're aware of how much normal emphasis we put on eating. It's just kind of our, our days sort of uh, revolve around breakfast and lunch and dinner or whatever. I was raised calling it breakfast and dinner and supper. However you call those meals, those, those three meals that you, that you have, we kind of, we kind of just uh, operate out, out of that. And so fasting is our appetites being broken. It deals with our stomachs. Y'all ever travel with your children when they were smaller and you, you, uh, you leave home and you're on your way and got several hours uh, to go and one of the kids says, uh, when are we stopping to eat? I'm starving. You ever heard them say that? I'm starving. Of course they're not starving and most of us have rarely ever been in a situation where we were starving. Our world experiences it. So many people in our world can say, I'm starving, and they really are. I'll never forget going to India a number of years ago and standing in a line where children and women were standing in line to be fed, and there were not tens of them, there were not dozens of them, there were not scores of them, there were not hundreds of them, there were thousands of them in the city that was then called Calcutta, out at the city dump. And there was a ministry that I was a part of during that time that fed those who came out there. Most of them lived in the city dump. They found scraps to make a shack out of and they lived there and they were standing with their bowls and their uh, containers to get some liquid and to get some mush that would allow them to survive through that day. I'll never forget looking into their eyes and serving them as they came. And so many of them did not, even though they were starving, did not immediately dip into the uh, bowl of mush and drink. It. They went off to themselves and had some time together as they ate what was provided for them. But most of us do not know about being, star being hung that hungry, but our, much of our, our world is. But that's one of the reasons that fasting is a legitimate Christian discipline, to think about those who do not have food, but also to keep us from concentrating on what we just usually concentrate on, and that is our stomachs growling or whatever. They, they were fasting as a part of their brokenness. And then also, the Bible says they, they wore sackcloth. Sackcloth is kind of like a, a burlap material, scratchy, uh, wouldn't be the most pleasant thing to put on, on your body. And they would wear that, again, as a sign of brokenness before God, uh, uh, you know, really related to their appearance. You know, we, we prefer to look nice. Uh, I think most everybody here this morning stood in front of the mirror, at least for a moment or two, and checked ourselves out before uh, we showed up in front of other people uh, today. 
But we can be too involved in our appearance. Have you ever noticed how many commercials on TV are relating to appearance? How, how, our, our body weight, our size, our looks, our hair, our skin, whatever it might be, just uh, so much emphasis on appearance. Well, you put on some old rough burlap sackcloth, it's a, it's a brokenness about our appearance. It's to say, uh, you know, our, our bodies, we don't want to just keep concentrating on, on our, our bodies. So that's a, appearance. And then uh, the, the Bible says that uh, they put dust on their heads. Have you ever been uh, involved out at the beach or somewhere and got sand in your hair? You, you know how it just makes your head itch or, or whatever? Why, why would anybody put dust in their hair? Why, why would they deprive themselves of having a clean head without dirt uh, uh, there? Well, of course, it's another sign of brokenness. It's another sign of uh, with dirt in your hair, you're not, uh, you're not puffed up about how great you are. You're thinking about getting that dirt out of your, out of your hair. When they, you know, uh, our Catholic friends oftentimes around uh, Easter time, they'll, they'll have an Ash Wednesday where they take ashes and uh, the priest will put the ashes on their forehead. It's, a, it's just simply a sign of brokenness and confession. And so that, and as a matter of fact, dust on their head is kind of where that uh, idea originates or that custom originates. There. So... Here was, here was brokenness about their appetites and about their appearances and about their achievements. I think it was A.W. Tozer who made this statement. It is doubtful whether God can ever bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Brokenness has to occur if revival occurs. We have to be willing for God to to break us. I know all of us have had our various hurts along the way and we need to know how do we handle hurts? Well, you can nurse your hurts, you can curse your hurts, you can rehearse your hurts, or you can reverse your hurts. You know, a lot of people stand around just talk about how bad things are, they just nurse their hurts. Others curse their hurts, just maybe using even profanity to, about the bad thing. Others rehearse their hurts. You remember that Elvis Presley began to focus on his mom dying in her 40s, and he would tell friends and he would make it public, just like my mom died in her 40s, I know I'm going to die in my 40s, and of course he did. Just like my mom died of a sudden heart attack, death, I'm going to die like that. He rehearsed that in his mind, in his thoughts, in his words. And when we have hurts and we rehearse them, we keep going over them, we keep talking about them to others, it's natural that things are going to come on. Or we can do a fourth thing, we can reverse our hurts. I remember reading a book years ago called Turn Your Scars into Stars. And we can do that. We can take those things where we've gotten ourselves broken and we can change those things. We can turn them into something else. Somebody asked a preacher one time, what is the unforgivable sin? I loved his answer. The sin you won't confess. The unforgivable sin is the one we won't confess. And so that's why the people of God found themselves broken. The people, they were willing to break with the idol worshipers. The Bible says the people who were dragging them down and turning them against God, they broke fellowship with them. They were willing to break with their own sins, the Bible says. They confessed those sins. They departed from those sins. They changed those sins. They were broken by the Word of God. Hours on end listening to God's word and confessing. And they were broken by their worship. True worship of God brings us into our own sinfulness and helps us to recognize God's holiness. So, if we have revival, y'all, there's going to be brokenness. But there's a second thing here, too. And that is, there's going to be blessedness. That, that prayer that follows the, that first part 
uh, if, if, if we talk about brokenness being repentance toward God, then blessedness is praise to God. It's the worship and praise that they experience. Uh, verses 5 through 38 of Nehemiah 10 is the longest prayer in the entire Bible. You know, Jesus' prayer in, in John 17 is a long prayer, but this is the longest prayer in, in the Bible. And in that prayer, and we, we wouldn't have time uh, to, to go through it today, maybe there would be another time that we could just look at that prayer because it's so powerful. That prayer acknowledges God who presides. The verses 6 through 8 talk about God being over it all. He created it all. He is the one who's in charge of it all. He presides. He performs. God's work through storms and through trials and through difficulty, God is in the midst of that, overpowering those things. God pardons. The prayer is a prayer uh, acknowledging the forgiveness of God and how we can come to God and find uh, forgiveness and God provides and those last verses and we picked up there in those last verses how God provides for his own in other words God is our GPS GPS God guides God provides and God supplies and that's really what the people of Nehemiah's day recognized and they came to God uh, acknowledging his blessedness and their blessedness because of him. Praise to God. That's, that will happen in revival. It will be spontaneous in revival. Uh, Jonathan, you, you won't have to crank us up. It will just, it'll, it'll just happen. We'll, we'll be praising God for who he is and thanking him for what he's done. It will be that kind of experience in God's ministry and God's work, that blessedness. But then there's a third thing. So what will happen if revival, when revival comes? There'll be brokenness, there'll be blessedness, and there will be busyness. Busyness. The Bible says that these people entered into a covenant with God. So if the first thing is that brokenness is repentance toward God, and the second thing is praise to God, this third thing is covenant with God. God, busyness. I know many of you have heard me say when I was growing up, I was an RA, Royal Ambassador. That's like Boy Scouts, except it's in the church. It's based on the Bible. It's about missions and evangelism and God working in our lives. And it's about being an ambassador for heaven's kingdom down here in earth's kingdom. And the song that we always sang in every chapter meeting was entitled, The King's Business. And here's what I would sing. I am a stranger here within a foreign land. My home is far away upon a golden strand, ambassador to be of realms beyond the sea. I'm here on business for my king. Well, we all are. You don't have to be a member of the RAs to be on business for the king. That's what we're about. Was it in the Old Testament once where Scripture says the king's business requires haste? Didn't Jesus tell the story about the man who went away and gave his uh, servants money for them to invest? And he said, uh, you do business while I'm gone. Doing business means we take care of that which belongs to the kingdom. And in this case, with the people of Nehemiah, it involved a covenant that they made, a covenant with God that they made. Verses 32 through 37, again, I won't take time to read that once more, but uh, that's where the people uh, said, Lord, we enter into a covenant with you. You know, we use that phrase, signed, sealed, and delivered. Well, in this case, it was the opposite. Delivered, signed, and sealed. They delivered, uh, and, and they said, Lord, we're delivering in a covenant with you, and the verdict is in. We're guilty. We're guilty. The verdict was in. I don't think I've mentioned to you all that a number of years ago, I got a, I got a ticket driving through Mount Pleasant, not Tennessee, but Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. It's flat as a flitter in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. 
And why they ever called it Mount Pleasant, I, I'm not exactly sure. It's a kind of an island almost in itself outside of Charleston, South Carolina. And I was driving to deliver some things to First Baptist Church of Mount Pleasant, and I saw a light back behind me going off, and it was a policeman, and he was, uh, he was stopping me for speeding. I knew I wasn't going fast. But it turned out I was in a 15-mile speed uh, zone, and I was going about 40 miles. Like I, I would have been, I wasn't speeding in, on my... And then, so he wrote me out a ticket. And I got kind of irritated about it. I got up in arms uh, about it. And so uh, I decided I was going to do something about it. For one thing, after he wrote the ticket and drove off, I drove back around that area I was driving in to find the sign. It was partially covered by some of that Charleston moss, you know, hangs down from the trees. Did y'all hear about the little boy that went to Charleston that they asked about his impressions of Charleston? He said, trees so old they have beards. Well, you know, they have that moss that, that hangs down. <clears throat> it was partially covering up that. <clears throat> sure, enough, excuse me. sure enough, it was an area where I think there was uh, some handicapped children, and so they had uh, created a 15-mile zone. And it was there, but I still was angry about it. I, you know, I was upset because the sign was partially covered. I couldn't see it clearly. So I decided to go to court about it. And I did. Went to the Mount Pleasant, South Carolina courtroom one Saturday morning. They had them on Saturdays. I don't know why. Maybe they didn't have full-time uh, judges. I, I'm not sure about that. But anyway, I sat there as different people would come along. And the policeman who had arrested them for whatever was there reading off the charges. And somebody would come, and they'd make their appeal, and the policeman would say they were, they were doing so-and-so in a so-and-so mile zone, or they were driving erratically, or didn't have you know, something else uh, that they should have had on their vehicle, or whatever. And the judge, who came in in a wheelchair, and that even gave me a little bit more uh, kind of, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to win this case. I, I do believe. I mean, I've got a lot of reasons not to get a ticket about that. So uh, he came in in the wheelchair. The, the policeman would read off the charges, and the judge would say, "How do you plead, guilty or not guilty?" And the people would say that. Generally, they said guilty, Your Honor. And he'd hit them down with the gavel and say, "Okay, go pay your fine." Well, that kept happening. I think it was alphabetical. So the Abels came, and the Bakers came, and the Cochrans came, you know, all those different ones. And then Mr. Dawson, Michael Dawson. And I'd seen all those things happen. I'd seen the process it went through. And I stood before him with my, you know, I'm kind of going to defend my, uh, myself. And the uh, he said, what are the charges? And the policeman read it. He was going 40 miles an hour in a 15-mile zone. I mean, it's, you know, pretty, pretty clear. Well, I'm getting ready to kind of give my defense. And the judge said, how do you... Uh, how do you plead, Mr. Dawson? I said, guilty, Your Honor. And crack, you know, down, down went the gavel, and I paid my fine, and I left. You know, it, I, I, I seem to have gotten all my excuses and all my reasons that they ought, but once it was read, I mean, I did what the, what the law said. I, I violated the law. I was guilty, and I paid the fine, and I was glad to get out with just paying the fine. I'm glad he didn't sentence me to jail or something else. But I'm saying... That's what happened with the people of God. Guilty, Your Honor. We, we have sin. That's so hard for people to say. You remember Fonzie in Happy Days? He couldn't say I was wrong. He would say I was... Rrr, rrr, rrr. I was rrr, rrr, rrr. Well, you're that way. I'm that way. I mean, we, we, we tend to uh, not love to admit... Do you love to admit to your spouse or your parents or your children, I was wrong. We don't like to say that. And yet here were the people of God in revival and they delivered the verdict. Guilty, Your Honor, guilty. And then they signed it. The Bible says, as a matter of fact, the next chapter in Nehemiah is name after name after name after name. They signed a document of some sort that was a covenant with God they signed it. They put their names on it. They wrote it, the Bible says there in that verse. And then they sealed it. The Bible says we have put our seal into it. The last verses of that text. They sealed it. How did they seal it? 
Well, probably the way any kind of sealing was done in those days. Poured wax on some document and put their signet ring down in it to say, this, this is binding. Oftentimes if something was like a scroll in the book of Revelation that's rolled up and it's got seals on it, places that have to be broken, the wax has to be broken open to reveal the next part and the next part. So that was, it was, it was sealed. I think this says to us, when we come to God, we need to deliver the covenant with God. We need to sign it. Lord, I put my name on it, and we need to seal it. Do you all remember that? I think it was in World War II, as soldiers were over in the overseas, and they would write back to their wives or their sweethearts. They would oftentimes put on the outside of the envelope, S-W-A-K. S-W-A-K. And it was kind of picked up. People did that. I, I can remember, you know, in school days, writing love letters. And on the outside, S-W-A-K. Remember what that stood for? Sealed with a kiss. Sealed with a kiss. In other words, as I'm licking this envelope, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm sealing it with a kiss. Well, I believe when we do covenant with God, when we enter, enter into an agreement with Him, we need to say, Lord, I'm delivering it to you. I'm guilty. Lord, I'm signing it, putting my name on the dotted line. Lord, I'm sealing it with my love for you. You've loved me enough to give yourself for me on the cross. In love, I give myself back to you. You know, for a person coming to Christ the very first time, that means I, I realize how much you love me and and I want to love you back, and I want to live for you. But for those of us who've known the Lord for a time, it's a little bit different. I heard that the Punjab of India years ago went to see the Queen of England at the time that England was in charge of India. India was a, a part of the British Empire. And this, this world's famous diamond called the Kuhnur Diamond had been discovered in India, and of course, since India was owned at that time by Britain, it went to the Queen of England, and she stored it in the tower. But a, a new Punjab had come to India, young, and he visited over in Britain, and he visited the Queen, and he said, Queen, it's a joy to visit with you. Could you bring the Kuhnur diamond down from the tower? <gasps> Gasp went out over all the king's servants. But she sent for the Kuhnur diamond. And the person came carrying it in a velvet pillow and it sparkled in the light. And the Punjab walked over to it and picked it up. People weren't really generally allowed to do that, but since he was the Punjab of India, he could do it. He saw it sparkling. And then he knelt before the queen and said, Queen... When this Kuhnur diamond was given to you, I was too young to understand the value of it. Now, recognizing the value of it, I give it back to you. I'm your servant, and I give this diamond back to you. And you know, I think that's what we do when we come to the Lord in revival. Lord, I give my love back to you. I want it fresh and new. I don't want to be like the church at Ephesus. I, 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 I want to have a new love for you. I don't want to leave my love. It's a fresh thing, sealed with a kiss, a passion that causes us to have a renewed fellowship with Jesus. So be it. Lord, send revival. Bow with me, please, as we pray just for a moment. Father, we thank you for the privilege today that we have to open your word and see what happens when revival comes. Oh, Lord, we ask you, send it again. Send it to Dale Wood. Send it to my heart. Send it to our heart. Send a great revival to our souls, I pray. And do it beginning even this day. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a song to close this morning, to close the sermon time. And it's one that I know, maybe you don't. You, maybe you're not like I was and grew up with this one. But it, it says, Lord, 
send a great revival to my soul. Let, let it be, send a revival and let it begin in me. That's, that's the words of the prayer. I'd like for us to sing it this morning. Uh, Jonathan said he'd uh, get familiar with it this week and so he could lead us in it uh, today. And, and I, I want to mean it when I sing it. I don't want to just mouth the words. I, I want him to send revival. And I know where it starts. Right here. My heart. My home. Your heart. Your home. And so I'd like for us to sing it. If, if there's some sort of response that you feel led to make while we're singing it, fine. But let's, let's sing it as unto the Lord. Jonathan. Let's stand together and let's sing. Let's sing together. So be it. Father, I thank you for Drew this morning uh, coming in a sense of brokenness and saying he wants to be used by you in whatever way you choose to use him to help revival to come. And may that really be the prayer of every one of us here this morning that we'll say, Lord, I don't know what it is you want me to do to be a part of a great revival, but I don't want to miss out on it. I, I want to be in on it. And I pray that you, will, that you will do that in each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, please, just for a moment. Uh, Jonathan will kind of wrap up here today about any announcements, and then we'll, we'll let you kind of visit together a little bit. Uh, Fadi said it might take him until about 12.15 to finish up his message and then to get to a room where he can... Uh, sit down and uh, meet, meet with us. So uh, Jonathan will take, take us a few minutes too to get ready for that. But Jonathan, what else do you need to tell us before, before that? Sure. Uh, just three things to share with everybody uh, today. First off, if this is your first time here with us, we wanted to say hi and we're so glad you're here. Uh, after the service, Brother Mike and I will be out in the lobby and we'd love to meet you. Uh, but we'd love to, to connect with you if you're new today. So uh, that's the first thing to know. Secondly, uh, Brother Mike mentioned earlier today that our Wednesday Bible study uh, and prayer, he will be out of town uh, this Wednesday, so I'll be there with you guys. And uh, as he mentioned, uh, our Independence Day is still about a week and a half away, but this Wednesday will be the Wednesday preceding that. So 
just want to take some time to do some guided prayer for our country. Together. I know. Uh, uh, so I love know. if you could join us for that. We'll do our first half of the prayer meeting like we normally do and share prayer requests. Yes, ma'am. Pray over those. And then the second half, She's instead of uh, studying a scripture passage, we'll spend some more time in prayer uh, and some guided prayer for our country. So that's this Wednesday right here in the fireside room. I'd love it if you could join us for that. Uh, the third thing, as Brother Mike mentioned, we have a Q&A uh, coming up immediately after worship with Fadi al Hajal from Brentwood Baptist Church. Uh, we're so excited to have him with us. And what we're going to do, uh, we're going to take about a 10-minute break. So uh, we'll dismiss in just a minute. We'll break for about 10 minutes. So if you need to go to the restroom, grab something to drink, anything like that, feel free to do that. Uh, come back by about 12.15. That's when Fadi can join us. And we'll have a short Q&A time. He's going to talk for just a little bit and share some things with you guys that may answer some questions that you have before you even have the chance to ask them. And then we'll open the floor up for some questions. And anything that you'd like to ask him will be... Uh, You'll be free to do. I'm going to take this microphone stand right here and put it in the middle of the floor, and we'll have a camera in the back that will allow Fadi to see us. So just come up to the microphone. Everybody can hear you that way, including Fadi, and then uh, he'll be able to see you that way too. So uh, that's how we'll do our Q&A. Remember, if, even if you have a loud voice that carries, Fadi can't hear it across Nashville uh, at Harper Heights, so we want to make sure to, to speak in the microphone when we have our Q&A time today. So uh, that's coming up in just a few minutes at 12.15. Um, and that's all that we wanted to remind you about today. We're going to conclude uh, with a time of music. We're going to end with one of the songs we started with, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. So if you'll stand and sing with us, we'll sing uh, just the chorus together. in about 10 minutes for our Q&A with Fadi.